Ashley Brock Green or Robert's book, Sea Swept, Chapter 12, and it's rated R. His blood was already pounding, a hard primal beat as he took a step forward. He looked into her eyes, wanting to see every shift and flicker of emotion. I'm going to want to do more than try, so be sure. Sometimes, she thought, you had to go with your instincts, with your cravings. At that moment, hers, all of hers, centered on him. You wouldn't be here tonight if I wasn't. With a slow curving of lips, she reached up and twined her hair around her finger. She could handle him. She was sure of it. He put his hands on her hips. This was no pencil-slim model with a body like a boy, but a woman. And he wanted her. He smiled back. He could handle her. He was sure of it. You like to gamble, Anna. Now and then. Let's roll the dice. He brought her against him in one hard jerk. One that made her breath catch and release an instant before his mouth was on hers. The kiss was so quickly desperate, quickly ravishness, tongues tangled, teeth nipped, the little feral purrs that sounded in her throat went straight to his head like hot whiskey. She tugged his shirt free of his waistband, then her hand shot under, flash and muscle. She needed to feel it. With a hum of pleasure, she kneaded and scraped and stroked till that flesh seemed to burn under her fingers. Those muscles hardened like iron. She wanted those muscles, that strength, pitted against her own. He fumbled at the back of her dress, searching for a zipper. She laughed breathlessly, with her mouth at his throat. It doesn't have a zipper. She closed her teeth over his jaw, didn't bother to be gentle. You have to peel it off. Jesus. He tugged a snug, stretchy material off her shoulder and replaced it with teeth as the craving for the taste of flesh, her flesh, overwhelmed him. They circled like dancers, though their pace outdistanced the dreamy strands of the choplin prudelieu that had replaced the boss. He towed off his shoes. She rushed open the buttons of his shirt. His head was swimming as they bumped into the bedroom door. She laughed again, but the sound slipped to toward a moan when he yanked the dress down to her waist. When those eyes of smoke steel streaked down, when he lowered his head, he began to devour the flesh above the black lace edge of her bra. His tongue slid under, teasing and tasting, until her knees were loose and her head full of flashing lights and colors. She knew he could do this to her, take her to that teetering edge of reason and insanity. She wanted him to. More, she wanted to take him there with her. The wanting was huge, ruthless, keen, recklessly primitive. For now, for both of them, it was all that mattered. Murmuring, mindlessly, she dragged off a shirt and dug her nails into the hard ridge of his shoulders. His chest was broad and firm, the flesh hot and smooth under her roaming hands. There were scars under the shoulder, along the ribs, the body, she thought, of a risk-taker, of a man who played to win. With a quick and expert flick of his fingers, he opened the front hook and left her breast fill his let her breast filled his greedy hands. She was magnificent, golden skin and lush curves. He thought her body almost impossibly perfect, yet it was erotically real, soft and firm and smooth and fragrant. He wanted to bury himself in her, but when she tugged at the bottom of his slacks, he shook his head. Oh, uh, I want you in bed. He brought her hands up until they circled his neck, brought his mouth down, until the kiss was savaging his honey. I want you under me, over me, wrap around me. She kicked off one shoe, balanced herself as they swayed toward the bed. I want you inside me. Kicked off the other as they tumbled to the mattress. She rolled over him first, straddling him. The light was nearly gone. Only a pale wash from the setting sun slipped through the windows. Shadows shifted. Her lips were hungry, restless, racing over his face, his throat. Though she had wanted men before, now there was a fearish and primal greed sweeping through her that she'd never experienced. She would take him with was all she could think, take what she wanted and ease this almost unbearable need when she arched back and her upper body was still weighted. In that fra fragile light, the breath clocked in his lungs he wanted with an urgency. He couldn't remember, fell for anything or anyone else. The desire to take, to possess, to own, surged violently in his already raging body. He reared up, gripping her hair in one hand. Yanking her head back to expose that long column of throat to his mouth. He could have anything with her. Would have everything. He was rougher than he meant to be as he pushed her back on the bed. His breath was already heaving as he locked his hands with hers. Her eyes were dark and gleaming. The kind of eyes, he thought, for a man to drown in. Her hair tangled mess of black silk against the deep bronze of the spread. The scent of her was more than a provocative invitation. It was a smoldering demand. Take me. 
seemed to say, if you dare, I could eat you alive. He murmured and once more crushed his mouth to hers. He held her down, knowing that if she wrestled free, it would be over too soon. Fast. God. Yes, he wanted fast, but he didn't want it to end. And he thought he could live his life right here in this bed with an honest, quivering body under his. Her hands flexed under his. Her body arched when he drew the tip of her breast into his mouth. He could feel her heart beat stumble as he used teeth, tongue, lips to taste, to pleasure them both. When he filled himself on her, fed himself on her, he released her hands to touch and be touched. They rolled over the bed, groping, tucking at the clothes that remained between them. Their breath was quick and labored, punctuated by half gasps and low moans that spoke of turbulent thrills, dark delights. Sensation slid over sensation, building trembling layers toward delirium. She shuddered under his hands, nearly wept as each new lash of pleasure whipped through her, each sharp and separate. She fought to bring him the same barbed an edgy ache. His hands closed over her. She was hot and wet and ready. Her body arched. Her nails bent into his back as her system exploded to peak. Then they went mad. She would remember only a battle for more and more, still more. Wild animal sex, a craving to mate. Seeking hands slid off damp flesh. Hungry mouth sought hungry mouth. She came again, and her cry of release was a half sob of both triumph and helplessness. The light was gone, but he could still see her. The glint of those dark eyes, the generous shape of that beautiful mouth. The blood roared in his head and in his heart and in his loins. He could think only now and drove himself hard and deep inside her. His vision's great. His vision great. His mind reeled. There remained poise for shivering moment joined it. Made it. He wasn't even aware that his hands sought hers, that their fingers locked in their fists. Then they began to move, a race now full of speed and urgency. There was the good, healthy sound of damp flesh slapping against damp flesh. Their gazes met and held. He watched her eyes go blind and oblique as she crested it. He heard the moan tear from her lips an instant before he closes over hers to swallow the sound. Her hips pumped like pistons, urging him on, driving him closer to his own, own jagged brink. He hammered himself into her, holding on to the edge by his fingertips, watching her, watching her while the need for release clawed viciously at his gut, and her body went taunt. A drawn bow of shock and pleasure. It was her scream. He swallowed as he let himself fall. He couldn't possibly move. Cam was certain that if someone held a gun to his head at that moment, he would simply lie there, take the bullet. At least he'd die a satisfied man. He couldn't think of a better place to be than stretched out over Anna's curvy body with his face buried in her hair. If he stayed there long enough, he might get a second wind. The music had changed again. When his mind cleared enough for him to tune in, tune into it, he recognized Paul Simon's clever twists of lyrics and melody. He nearly drifted off as he was invited to call the singer out. If you fall asleep on top of me, I'm going to have to hurt you. He drummed up the energy to smile. I'm not going to sleep. I'm thinking about making love to you again. Oh, she struck her hands down his back to his hips. Are you? Yeah, just give me a couple minutes. I'd be glad to, if I could breathe. Oh. Lacely propped himself on his elbows, looked down at her. Sorry. She only grinned. No, you're not. You're smug, but so am I. So that's okay. It was great sex. It was great sex, she agreed. Now, I'm going to finish dinner. We'll need fuel if we're going to try that again. Both delighted and baffled, she said, You're a fascinating woman, Anna. No games, no pretenses. Looking the way you do, you could have men jumping through hoops. She gave him a little shove so she could wiggle free. What makes you think I haven't? You're exactly where I wanted you, aren't you? Smiling, she rose and walked naked to the closet. That's a hell of a body you've got there, Miss Spinelli. She glanced over her shoulder as she wrapped herself in a short red robe. Same to you, Quinn. She headed out to the kitchen, humming to herself as she turned the heat back on under the sauce, filled a pot with water for the pasta. Lord, it was lovely, she thought, to feel so loose, so limber, so liberated. However reckless it might be for her to take Cameron Quinn as a lover, the results were worth every risk. He made her aware of every inch of her body and every inch of his. He made her feel painfully alive. And best of all, she mused as she took out the bread she wanted to toast slightly. He seemed to understand her. It was one thing to be wanted by a man, to be satisfied by a man, but it warmed her heart to be liked by the man who desired her. She turned and picked up her wine just as Cam came out of the bedroom, pulled on her slacks, but hadn't bothered to hook them, and <laughs> sipped slowly while she studied him over the rim of her glass, broad shoulders, hard chest, the waist that tampered, 
to narrow hips and long legs. Oh, yes, he had a terrific body. For now, it was all hers. She lifted a pepper from the tray and held it up to his lips. It's got a bite, Cam said as the heat filled his mouth. Mm-hmm. I like bites. She picked up his wine and handed it to him. Hungry? As a matter of fact. It won't be long. Because she recognized the look in his eyes. She slipped around the counter and stared up. The water's nearly on the boil. <laughs> you know what they say about a watch pot. He began to stutter around the counter after it was the sketch of on the refrigerator that distracted him from his half-formed plan to wrestle her to the kitchen floor. Hey, that looks just like foolish. It is foolish. Seth drew. Get out. He hooked the thumb in his pocket as he took a go to study. Really? That's damn good, isn't it? I didn't know the kid could draw. Even if you spent more time with him. I spend time with him every day. Cam doesn't tell me dick. Cam didn't know where the big annoyance had come from, but he didn't care for it. How'd you get this out of him? I asked, she said simply, and, this sl and slid the guinea into the boiling water. Cam shifted on. Look, I'm doing the best I can with the kid. I didn't say you weren't. Wasn't. Weren't. I just think you'd do better with a little more pra practice and a little more effort. She pushed her hair back. She had meant to get into this. See, her relationship with Cam was supposed to have two separate compartments without their contents getting mixed up together. You're doing a good job. I mean that. But you've got a long way to go, Cam, in gaining trust, his affection, giving your own. He's an obligation you're fulfilling, and that's admirable. But he's also a young boy. He needs love. You have feelings for him. I've seen them. She smiled over him. You just don't know what to do with them yet. Cam scrowled at the sketch. So now I'm supposed to talk to him about drawing dogs. Anna sighed and turned to frame Cam's face in her hands. Just talk to him. You're a good man with a good heart. The rest will come. Annoyed again. Kept the rest. Couldn't have said why. The quiet understanding in her voice and amused compassion in her eyes made him nervous. I'm not a good man. His grip tight just enough to make her eyes her eyes know. I'm selfish, impatient. I go for the thrills because that's what suits me. <sighs> Paying and debts doesn't have anything to do with having a good heart. I'm a son of a bitch. And I like it that way. She merely arched her mouth. It's always wise to know yourself. He felt a little flutter of panic and turned it on. I'll probably hurt you before we're done. And I told her that. Maybe I'll hurt you first. Well, to risk it, he didn't know whether to laugh or swear. He ended up pulling her into his arms for a good. Let's eat in bed. That was the plan, she told him. The pasta was cold by the time they got to it, but that didn't stop them from eating ravenously. They sat cross-legged on her bed, and he's bumping and ate in the glow of the half-dozen candles she'd lit lighted. Cam shoveled in Laguini and closed his eyes and pierced into blood. God damn, this is good. <laughs> Anna would have wound past expertly around a pork and bit, and bit. You should see smile lasagna. I'm counting on it. Relaxed and lazy, he broke a piece of the crusty bread she put into a wicker basket and handed half to her. Her bedroom, he noted, was different from the rest of the apartment. Here she hadn't gone for the practical or the streamlined. The bed itself was a wide pool covered wide pool covered in soft rose seats and a slick satin duvet and rich bronze. The headboard was a romantic arch of wrought iron, curvy and frivolous, and plumped now with a dozen fat, colorful pillows. The dresser he pegged as an antique, a heavy old piece of monogamy, mahogany, refinished to rosy gleam. It was covered with pretty little bottles and bowls with a silver-backed brush. The mirror over it was long oval. There was a mahogany lady's vanity with a skirted stool and glittering brass handles. For some reason, he always found that particular type of furniture incredibly sexy. The copper urn was, was filled with tall flesh fuzzy flowers. The walls were crowded with art and the windows framed the same rich bronze as the spread. This, he thought oddly, was Anna's room. The rest of the apartment was still Miss Spinelli's. The practical and the sensual both suited her. He reached over the side of the bed to the floor. He put the bottle of wine. He topped off her glass. Trying to get me drunk? He flashed a grin at her. Her hair was tangled the rope loose enough to have one shoulder curving free. Shoulder curving free. Her big, dark eyes seemed to laugh at both of them. Don't have to, but it might, make, might be interesting anyway. She smiled, shrugged, and drank. Why don't you tell me about your day? Today, gave Mark daughter, nightmare time. Really? She told more positive fed to him. Details. Shopping, shoes, hideous. When she laughed, he felt the smile split his face. God, she had a great laugh. I made Ethan and Philip go with me. 
No way I was facing that alone. We had to practically handcuff the kid to get him to go. I think I was fitting him for a strike jacket instead of new high tops. <laughs> Too many men don't appreciate the joys, challenges, and nuances of shopping. Next time you go. Anyway, I had my eye on this building on the waterfront. We checked it out before we headed to the mall. It'll do the job. What job? The business. Boat building. And a center fork down. You're serious about that? <laughs> Dead serious. The place will do. I need some work. But the rent's in line. Especially since we're strong-armed. The landlord into paying for most of the basic repairs. You want to build boats? It'll get me out of the house. Keep me off the streets. When she didn't smile back, he shook his head. Yeah, I think I could get into it. For now, anyway. We'll do this one for the client. Ethan's already got lined up. See how it goes from there. I take it you signed the lease? That's right. Why well, puts around? Some might say caution, consideration, details. I learned the caution and consideration. I leave the caution and consideration to Ethan. The details to Philip. If it doesn't work, all we lost is a few bucks in a little time. Odd how that prickled temper suited him. She mused and went so well. This dark damn it all looks. And if it does work, Shad, have you thought of that? What do you mean? If it works, you'll have taken on another commitment. It's getting to be a habit. She laughed out the expression of annoyance and surprise on his face. It's gonna be fun to ask you how you feel about all this in six months or so. She leaned forward and kissed him lightly. How about some dessert? The nagging word, the nagging worry, the word commitment had brought him faded back as her lips rubbed over his. What you got? Cannoli. She told him as she set their plates on the floor. Sounds good. Or, watching him, she unbelted a rope, let it slide off her shoulders. Me? Sounds better. He said his letter pull it to him, let her pull him to her. It was just after three when Seth heard the car pulling in the drive. He'd been sleeping but having dreams, bad ones, where he's back in one of those smelly rooms where the walls were stained and thinner than his drawing paper, and every sound carried through them. Sex noises, grunts and groans, the creaking mattresses, his mother's nasty laugh when she was coked up, made him sweat having those dreams. Sometimes she would come into where he was trying to find comfort and sleep on the mo moose musty sofa. If her mood was good, she would laugh and give him smothering hugs, walking home, walking him, waking him out of a fitful sleep into the smells and sounds of the world she dragged him into. If her mood was bad, she would curse and slap and often end up sitting on the floor crying wildly. Out of the way, made for one more miserable night. But worse, hundreds of times worse, was when one of the men she'd taken to bed slipped out, crept across the cramped room, and touched him. That didn't happen often. Waking up screaming and swinging drove them off. But the fear lived inside him like a red-hot demon. He learned to sleep on the floor, behind the sofa, whenever she had a man around. But this time, since that hadn't waked from, waked from a nightmare to worse, he fought his way out of the sweaty dream and found himself on clean sheets with a snoring puppy curled beside him cried a little because he was alone there was no one to see then he snuggled closer to foolish comforted by the soft fur and steady heartbeat the sound of the car coming and stopped him from drifting back to sleep his first thought was cops they'd come to get him to haul him away and he told himself even as his heart jumped up and pounded his throat that he was being a baby still crept out of bed bed padded silently to the window to look he had a hidden place picked out of if one was needed it was the Veta, Seth told himself. He didn't recognize the sound of its engine if he hadn't been half asleep, so it came get out. Or the soft, cheering, whistling. Been out poking at some woman. Seth decided it was near. Grown ups were so predictable. When he remembered that Cam was supposed to have dinner with a social worker that night, his eyes went wide. His jaw dropped. Man, oh man, the Cam was bouncing on Miss Spinelli. That was so weird. So weird. He realized he didn't know how he felt about it. One thing for sure he realized as Cam whistled his way to the door. Cam felt just fine and dandy about it. When he heard the front door close, he snuck to his home bedroom door. He wanted to get a quick peek, but at the sound of feet coming up the stairs, he dived back into bed, just in case. The pumpy whimpered, began to steer, and Seth slammed his eyes shut as the door opened. The footsteps came slowly, quietly toward the bed. His heart began to pound in his chest. What would he do? He thought, sick panic, God, what could he do? Foolish his tail began to thump on the bed as Seth cringed and waited for the worst. Guess you think this is a pretty good deal. Laying around half the day, getting your belly filled, having a nice soft bed at night. Cam murmured. His voice was slightly slurred from lack of sleep, but said, but said it sounded like drugs or liquor. 
He struggled to keep his breathing slow and steady, while his heart beat pounded like a jackhammer against his ribs in his head. Yeah, you fell into the roses, didn't you? I didn't have to do a dang, do a thing to earn it. Goofing looking dog. <laughs> Seth nearly blinked, realizing Cam was speaking of foolish and not to him. It'll be his problem, won't it? When you've grown and take up more of the bed than he does. Cautious, Seth slitted his eyes open just enough so he could see through his lashes. He saw Cam's hand come down, give foolish a quick careless stroke. Then the tangled sheets and blanket came up, smooth over his shoulders. That same hand gave Seth's head a quick and careless stroke. The door closed again. Seth waited 34 seconds before darting to dare to open his eyes. He looked straight into the foolish's face. The pup seemed to be grinning at him as though they'd gotten away with something. Grinning back, Seth draped an arm around the pup's pudgy body. I guess it is a pretty good deal, huh, boy? He whispered. In agreement, Foolish licked Seth's face, then yawned hugely, settled down to sleep again. This time, when Seth dropped off to sleep, there were no sweaty dreams to haunt him. End of chapter 12